Welcome to the sixth presentation in the third webinar series presented by the International Adsorption Society. The IAS is an international organization dedicated to advancing adsorption as a solution to scientific, engineering, and human welfare challenges through the promotion of adsorption research and education. We hope all of our attendees, their families, and their colleagues are safe amid the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. We thank everyone for attending the webinar today. The webinar series has been an immense success and the recordings of previous webinars continue to be viewed on YouTube. This is the sixth webinar in our third series, which we will continue to have monthly throughout the year. We intend to continue with a variety of speakers from industry, academia, and other research institutes, as well as PhD students and early career researchers. Announcements regarding the third series will be distributed through the IAS mailing list and uh, the IAS Twitter feed. Today's webinar will be given by Jamil J. Colon of the University of Notre Dame in the United States. I am Nicholas Wilkins of the University of Alberta. Today's webinar will be moderated by David Denacci at Imperial College London. We are required to remind attendees and future viewers that the views expressed by the speaker, host, or other moderators are not necessarily those of the IAS or the institutions associated with those individuals. We ask that you consider joining the IAS as a regular member if you are not already. Our dues are minimal, only 20 US dollars per year, but support the publication of our flagship journal, Adsorption, Contribute to Travel Grants, and workshop seed funding for IAS members and affiliated groups, as well as aid the organization of our triennial conference on the fundamentals of absorption. Members also receive free access to IAS supported materials, including our journal, as well as the absorption database published by Springer Materials. Anyone can follow the IAS on Twitter at intadsots for future updates regarding IAS events, webinars, and information about scientific meetings. Please help us expand our YouTube channel by liking this video and subscribing. I'll now hand it over to David Denacci, who will moderate the Zoom Q&A. Thank you very much, Nick. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce today Dr. Jamil Colon, uh, who obtained his uh, Bachelor of Science in Chemical Engineering from the University of Notre Dame in 2009. After graduation, he spent a year at the University of Santiago de Compostela, uh, undertaking research on a Fulbright scholarship. And then Dr. Colon joined uh, the Snur Group at Northwestern University, completing his PhD in 2015. Uh, his research there focused on computational generation and screening of porous materials for energy applications. He then joined the Di Pablo Group at the University of Chicago and Argonne National Laboratory as a postdoctoral researcher. His research efforts involved modeling the self-assembly processes of MOPS, understanding ion transport in polymeric systems, and development of software for enhanced sampling techniques. In 2018, Dr. Colon became the Melcor Visiting Assistant Professor in the Department of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering at the University of Notre Dame, uh, where he has been an assistant professor since 2019. His group leverages data science, statistical mechanics, molecular modeling, and machine learning tools to design and discover novel materials. During the webinar, Questions can be uh, submitted to the speaker in, in two ways, via the Q&A tab for those joining us on Zoom uh, or in the live chat on the YouTube screen. With that, uh, it's my uh, pleasure to introduce Jamil uh, and uh, happy for you to start when you're ready. Okay, thank you very much for that kind introduction, David. Um, and thank you to, to the organizers for, for the invitation to present today. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, so what I'll be talking about today is navigating adsorption landscapes in, in metal organic frameworks. Um, just to, to give you some sense of um, what we do in the group, 
Um, I'll be going through through some slides where we go first over sort of the overview of my research program, and then I'll jump right into it. Um, so before we do that, let me acknowledge other people who've done the work. So in this case, I'll be presenting some of the work during my PhD, and then some of the the recent work coming out of my group uh, that has been led by my student, uh, Krishnendra Mukherjee. And of course, uh, I have some amazing collaborators here at the University of Notre Dame, Professor Teng Fei Luo and Professor Alex Dowling. Um, NSF and the Energy have been great for, for funding resources for, for our group. And of course, uh, our, our computational resources here at the University of Notre Dame are excellent. So thank you to our Center for Research Computing for everything they do for us. Okay, so in the, the course of, of humanity, really, um, at least recorded history, we've characterized things like industrial revolution when there's a technological um, advancement that now enables a, a new form of, of economic growth and, and, and production. So the first one is recognized in the 1780s where you had sort of mechanical production equipment, the second one with electricity coming into the picture in the 1870s, and the third with IT and automated production in essentially the 1970s. Currently, thanks to the increasing connection and involvement of technology in our own lives and society, including sometimes even in our own bodies, many believe we are currently living in or in the cusp of the fourth industrial revolution. And so under that, uh, in that context, when we start thinking about that fourth industrial revolution, what does the future hold for society and technology? We think about the future of energy, infrastructure, the environment, health. It doesn't take very long for us to realize that the foundation uh, of, the, of those new technologies will be advanced materials. Right? So advanced materials um, for more efficient energy transformation, storage, um, advanced materials for, you know, direct air carbon capture or water capture directly from air, uh, for advanced diagnosis in terms of infrastructure when things are going, uh, maybe it may, uh, are going to fail, drug delivery, sensing of disease, et cetera. All those advancements that we foresee, advanced materials are at the very core of, of them. And so that then begs the question, well, where are those materials? How can we find them? It seems like this is an infinite sort of realm of possibilities. And then we need to find then those materials that are gonna be, uh, they're gonna work well for any given application. So that's um, sort of our, our guiding principle in our group. Of course, we, we have great expertise in the context of porous materials. So a lot of our efforts focus there, um, but that's, that's really what, what guides sort of the research and the science that we do in my group. So for things like the water energy nexus, right? So in broad strokes, that refers to this intricate relationship between water and energy, essentially how much water is necessary to produce energy, how much energy is necessary to produce water. Um, and so looking at porous materials, um, how the presence of defects may affect things, how do we do separations in the presence of water vapor, uh, and understanding those processes in materials is, is something that we are very active on. Also characterizing new hybrid type materials that have, can contain some permanently porous cage, but it's connected by very flexible linkers. And so you end up with amorphous structures that offer permanent porosity. Um, and how can we now tailor those for things that we like to do in the subject community, right? So can we guide search storage? Can we provoke certain transformations upon adsorption or desorption? How can we use these things for separation processes and so on? How, did, how then does the material change during those processes? And can we understand those to now enable materials design in those contexts? Of course, um, you know, a lot of the work that we do has to do with large scale, high super screening, sort of all these hypothetical materials. A, a big question that we get is, well, how do you know that you can make them? But understanding their self-assembly is important for that process. And that involves calculations, uh, at least for, for in, in our case, at different time and length scales. Um, so from the formation of you know, pre-nucleation building units, secondary building units, 
amorphous clusters, crystallins to how the, the reactions is terminating, are, are terminating, and then using advanced sampling techniques to model those processes and characterize free energy barriers. We also have efforts on screening materials um, for quantum technologies, in this case for photonic quantum technologies. Um, also have a, a, an ongoing collaboration with Professor McGinn here at the University of Notre Dame on looking at ionic liquids for rare earth element separations. And then some of the work that I'll be talking about today uh, using machine learning to, uh, to guide adsorption simulations and predictions. And so um, a lot of, uh, well, you know, the, the class of materials I will be focusing on today is metal organic frameworks. So these are crystalline, uh, for the most part, at least the ones that uh, people have been focusing on are nanoporous materials. These are self-assembled from metal nodes and organic linkers. And so you have this very large number of, of possible things that you could use to, to make these, right? So you, know, you can think about all the possible inorganic building blocks you can use, all the possible organic linkers you could use. And so the material now, the, the material space now sort of essentially explodes, right? Um, to add even more to that, those linkers then, or even the nodes um, could potentially be functionalized with, um, you know, open metals or, you know, fluorine groups or nitrous groups or, right, all sorts of chemistries that can help you now tailor sort of that pore space to, to a particular application that, that you would like. Okay, and so given this great versatility of these materials, they've been looked at for, you know, a great number of applications. We're seeing more and more on the biological side of things for, for drug delivery. Um, we've also seen a lot of work in the sensor design um, and development where potentially you could use them as detectors um, from uh, disease markers from breath, for instance. Um, you have things like a moisture harvester. So, you know, this has then implications in terms of, of course, water scarcity, potentially also uh, refrigeration cycles, things like that. Of course, CO2 capture is also a, a very um, prominent one in, in the moth field, hydrogen storage, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so clearly the number of applications is great. And just to give you a sense of sort of the diversity of structures that you can find within this class of materials, here's a very small subset of, of what you'll be able to find. So you have things like H equals one, for instance, which has this copper paddle wheel connects through these benzene uh, tricarboxylate linkers, and you end up with the stru three-dimensional structure with these kinds of types of pores. So, you know, for instance, this one's kind of large, has exposed benzene rings, right? And then you have this smaller one, which has a lot of the copper sites um, exposed to it, right? So you can now see you have different chemical environments uh, within the structure, and these things could, could be designed a priori. Um, you have things like SIF-71. So for instance, here you have a very tight window leading into a very large pore. You can imagine how uh, that can help with separation type applications. Things like MOF-74. So these are one-dimensional channels. And then you have essentially an open metal site sort of lining um, these rows here. And so it's been used for things like catalytic applications and also separations applications. And so due to sort of these you know, large number of potential materials, very diverse, you know, and through the, the course of my PhD, you know, these high throughput, large scale screening techniques started to, to pop up, where the idea is you're going to have some database of structures, these could be experimental, these could be computationally generated, and you're going to characterize, uh, you're going to characterize these uh, materials through their physical properties, you know, surface areas, void fractions, things like that. And also then evaluate their performance for, for a given application. So thanks to those efforts, really the, the, the data explosion has been large. And so now when we start dealing with these large number of, of data points, machine learning starts to play uh, an important role. And so <clears throat> there's a recently, I would say within the last five years, maybe even a little bit more, uh, machine learning has played a, a very a significant role in characterizing moths, discovering new moths and so on. And the general workflow, right, is, is looks something like this, right? So from, if you're looking back and you squint a little bit, all those workflows look more or less like this. 
you're going to have a lot of data that you're going to have to use for training your model, validating, testing your model. You're going to have some sort of machine learning algorithm involved. These could be, you know, supported vector machines. These could be your um, random forest. This could be your neural networks and so on. You also have sort of this descriptor, right? So essentially what this means is how do I turn what could be a crystallographic structure, XYC files, chemi chemical information, how do I turn that into something that these machine learning algorithms understand and can read, right? Do I need to break this up into sort of textural properties of these, or do I need to do something more advanced, um, right? So those are sort of that process. There's a lot of work there sort of trying to determine how, what, what are the best ways for us to describe these structures in a way that the machine learning algorithms can learn something meaningful and so that they can make their predictions. And then of course you have then, right, your databases of structures, right? These are the ones you're gonna, sub, you know, you're gonna subject to some sort of experiment or simulation to generate sort of these high fidelity data sets. And so these can be very, very large. And so, <clears throat> so far the efforts in, in my group have really focused on these two aspects of things generating these databases and generating these data sets, okay? So first gonna focus here on generating these databases. How do we generate MOS on a computer? Um, what are the potential ways that you could do that? And then we're gonna do then some absorption calculations on those databases of structures and, and see what, what we can learn from, from the resulting structure property relationships and how that sets us up um, moving forward for, for advanced analysis. Okay, so the way we uh, we did this, our motivation for doing these uh, calculations during my PhD was the context of hydrogen storage. And so this picture here on the right illustrates the, the hydrogen storage problem, if you will, um, quite nicely. So this is your average mid-sized vehicle. This is the size of your fuel tank relative to that that you would need to drive the same distance as you would in a normal tank of gas. All right, so this is hydrogen then in its different forms, as hydrides, as a liquid, as a gas at 200 bar. Okay, so clearly, right, these sizes right, in terms of your fuel tank, not necessarily the, the most reasonable given the size of the car and also maybe the conditions of, of the hydrogen, maybe not the safest either. So <clears throat> the Department of Energy had these uh, storage targets, which have been revised, but they, they still remain pretty similar as far as I understand. Um, so seven weight percent hydrogen, 70 grams per liter of hydrogen, and they want these uh, 243K and maximum pressure of 100 bar. Now, because um, a lot of the applications associated with hydrogen storage involve the use um, in, in vehicular applications, right? So in terms of a fuel tank, what we think really about is how to deliver that hydrogen because it's going to have to be something left over. And so we really worried about the working capacity of the material. Okay, so for instance, here I have how much gas absorbed versus pressure. <clears throat> if you have a material that interacts very strongly with the, with the hydrogen, you're gonna saturate very quickly. And so your working capacity is gonna be very small. Whereas if you have something that is capable of high capacity and doesn't necessarily have those strong interactions, now your, your deliverable amount is much higher. Right, so these are the things that we keep in mind when, when we're looking at these materials. Now, in the context of, of molecular simulations and, and addressing the performance of coarse materials, our workhorse is grand canonical Monte Carlo simulations. So what this means is <clears throat> we're gonna fix the chemical potential, the volume and the temperature of our system, and we're gonna allow then the number of molecules to fluctuate. So we're gonna run these simulations, we're gonna perform these moves, insertions, deletions, rotations, translations, and so on until we essentially converge and we can extract then for these conditions, how much was absorbed, okay? So that's the idea. In order to do this in the context of hydrogen, we're gonna um, hold the atom positions of, of the moth fixed. We're gonna use UFF for, for the force field parameters. We're also gonna treat hydrogen as a rigid molecule. We have a Leonard Jones sphere at the center of mass and then we have the charges associated with that. Um, as well, so at each one of the nuclei and also at the center of mass to get essentially the hydrogen quadruple. Okay, and so even before I even graduated undergraduate, um, 
right? Uh, Randy and others have been doing the simulations and showing that these types of models can actually be quite accurate. So here, the, the black lines, the black symbols <clears throat> represent the experiments and the open symbols are the simulations. All right, so this is hygiene absorption at 77K in Moth 5. Each one of these empty symbols is a separate GCMC simulation. Okay, so in the context of now evaluating sort of these large databases of structures, perhaps doing the full isotherm is not the best idea, but since we know what are the conditions that, that the targets ask for, we can limit then our simulations to just those, those points, okay? So that's what, what we're going to do. And we're gonna do that on a database of, of structures that we have computationally built, okay? You could also do this from experimental structures, right? There's a lot of work out there on curating those databases of materials that haven't actually synthesized and then passing those through computer simulations here. We're gonna build them on the computer. So at the time, <clears throat> Professor who now Professor Wilmer, um, established this um, and use these types of algorithms where now we're going to place the building blocks of the moth sort of sequentially and connect them until the crystal is formed. So we're going to take this algorithm and now we're going to, before we start connecting things, take the linkers and then start introducing chemical functionalities that are going to be good for hydrogen storage. So in this case, we were interested in this magnesium alkoxide functionalization, which we had previously screened. It's like, okay, this looks like it's promising for hydrogen storage. Let's now see what this looks like on a large scale basis. <clears throat> so we functionalize the linkers with varying degrees of magnesium alkoxide functionalization, and then we reconnect. And now we form this hypothetical dat a database of structures of over 18,000. Okay, and so we then we perform the GCMC calculations and we can look at the deliverable gravimetric okay, versus the deliverable volumetric hydrogen storage. And we're going to color in the magnesium density. So we see, okay, if you want high deliverable volumetric, then you know what this type of graph seems to point out is that you need, you're going to need high magnesium densities. Okay. And then even those that are the highest, well, they do okay in terms of the gravimetric. <clears throat> the ones that have very low magnesium density, then, you know, they're kind of stuck around this volumetric amount. Um, and then, but they're, they're still able to reach high gravimetric. Okay, so this is great, right? These types of studies, we were able to do this for all, this, all, all the structures in the database, get a sense of what, you know, these landscapes look like, right? Each one of these points is a separate structure, you know, makes these beautiful plots, but then Another thing that we can do is like, okay, well, where would we need to be to meet the DOE target? And this is where we need to be. Okay, so now we, we can start sort of asking a separate set of questions like, okay, are, are, are these reasonable for these types of materials? Do we need to maybe alter the strategy here in terms of the areas that we're able to explore in terms of the materials? And so along those lines, we started thinking about the topologies of the material. So when we <clears throat> do this bottom-up approach, right, we connect all of our structures, we end up with a crystal. So that crystal has an underlying net or topology, as right? is the PCU topology. So we thought, well, what if we start with the net and then end up with a ball? Okay, and so let's introduce then some things about nets. So <clears throat> if I follow any straight line and I change directions, that is called a node. Okay, and that which connects the nodes are going to be the edges. All right, so this is the, the cubic type structure. We have others, of course. So for instance, this has a four connected node okay, that then goes to a three connected node. But it's still only one type of edge because each edge connects always a three connected node to a four connected node. Okay, so these are the, the types of nets that, that we focus on uh, at the time. And so the way we're going to do this is we're gonna take then the building blocks that, that we know and that we've used before in, in, in the uh, bottom up uh, approach. And we're gonna sort of break them down to vectors. So we have a, ve you know, a set of vectors that originate from the center of the node and then goes towards the connection points. And I can do then something similar in the nets. And then all I have to do is line up then those vectors and then repeat across the whole structure. I can do then something similar with the edges, right? So I can now place 
um, these linkers here. And then once, once they're there, I just establish my connections and I'm done. Okay, so this is how we now construct new MOFs based off of topology. So we can now have a library of different chemistries that we can start mapping onto these, uh, these topologies. Now, something interesting happens when you start thinking about um, the chemistry in terms of nodes and edges. So if I follow this, this is a straight line. This is a change in direction. That means this is a node. So now I'm not necessarily thinking about collection of inorganic nodes and organic linkers. I'm just thinking of nodes and edges, okay? And so in the context of the TBO topology, that three connected node is the benzene ring. And then we have the four connected, which is the copper paddle wheel. I can establish my connections and now uh, finish this, okay? <clears throat> so this was particularly powerful because now we can generate really a set of uh, structures that is very diverse in topology. And in our case, um, to really showcase the power of, of computer simulations and molecular modeling, it led directly to materials discovery. So we have here gravimetric, uh, sorry, deliverable volumetric versus deliverable gravimetric absorption of hydrogen. This is at 77 Kelvin and 100 bar. Each one of these symbols represents a different structure and they're gonna be colored uh, according to their topology. Okay, so at the time we were really interested in these cyan colored uh, topologies. So this SHE topology, the reason being there was only one structure that we knew of um, that had that topology, this PCN224. It had a zirconium corner as a six connected and then this porphyrin <clears throat> as a four connected. And But now through our um, thinking of collections of nodes and edges, the identity, the chemical identity of those are switched. So now my six connected node is organic and my four connected node is inorganic. So this is a copper paddle wheel. And we ended up with these SHE MOFs, which were then communicated to, uh, to collaborators and then synthesized the lab and tested. So, right, this is now an example where you can do these generation, computational generations of structure, characterize them, address their performance, and now can lead directly to uh, new materials discovery. Okay, so that was one example there where, you know, we're really focusing on this generation of uh, databases and how do we, sort of brute force um, the production of these high fidelity data sets, okay? But, you know, especially as we've learned um, over the years um, and, and, you know, it was a particular point of emphasis at the last um, FOA uh, conference and, you know, through these uh, various IAS webinars, you know, a single point in the isotherm, it, it's not enough really sometimes, right? It, it helps you, to determine which ones are, are the, maybe not the very good materials, not necessarily which, one, which ones are the top ones. We really need to evaluate these things in a process mo uh, model to really address their performance. And to do, to do that, we need full isotherms, okay? And so now you start getting into the point where like, okay, can we really do that for these very large databases of structures? And it's not just one isotherm, it's not just one temperature, but multiple temperatures. And so now the, the, the data requirements um, for these proper evaluations and maybe using some machine learning techniques keeps increasing. And so we're gonna focus then on, on that aspect of things. And so the first idea we have is like, okay, well, we've spent a lot of time and effort in generating all of this data. Can we leverage it somehow to reduce the data burden moving forward? And in the cases that we can't, how can we be efficient as possible in that data generation. Okay. So if we look back at, at some of these large scale screening studies, we look at sort of the things like the textual properties, we can color in the different topologies, and we address absorption, we clearly see there are some patterns in, in, in this data. Okay, we clearly see that there is a complex relationship between how much, in this case, hydrogen is absorbed uh, with the textual properties. Okay, so we need sort of new ways then to, to relate those to each other to, to make predictions at the conditions that we want. And so in that, from that perspective, neural networks can be particularly powerful. Right? The whole idea behind a neural network is that given enough data, they, they can be universal approximators, right? So you can have some very complex relationship, a neural network can help you get there. 
Okay, so the idea is you're gonna have some input set of features, right? So this is your descriptors that I was talking about earlier. <clears throat> you're gonna have some weights associated with these, and then you're gonna transform them through some activation node. So this could be some sort of sinusoidal, uh, a tangent, like, right? All, all sorts of functions. And so through these transformations, then you can now start to approximate these complex relationships to get you um, the quantity that that you would like, right? So in the context that of MOFs, then those features are going to be the textual features, okay? And then we're going to have then these uh, layers that are going to help us approximate that. And we can then make predictions about um, adsorption quantities at given conditions based off of these textual properties, okay? And so people have been doing this, you know, now for, for quite some time. It's been shown to be very successful. So that's great news for us. Our concern was, uh, though, it's like, look, we noticed some similarities here between different adsorbates, right? And so that starts to sort of, you know, inspire us in a way. It's like, okay, can we use information about one type of adsorption to make predictions in other spaces, right? The, the, you know, this is volumetric adsorption versus gravimetric for hydrogen. This is the same for methane. These two graphs look very similar. The topologies that occupy the space, they occupy similar spaces. Okay, so is there something there? Can, can we leverage information from one space to make predictions about another? Okay, <clears throat> so what we're going to do is we're going to do transfer learning in this context. Okay, so we're going to take this type of procedure, we're now we're going to take the features and try to make these universal approximations towards those adsorption quantities. Okay, and this is we're going to, in most cases, we're going to be using hydrogen adsorption in this direct learning or normal training. And then to make predictions into another space, after we train this, we're going to fix all of the weights except for the last layer. Okay, so now I can retrain in another space and, and train fewer weights with the idea that that's going to lower the data requirements associated with the predictions in that new space. Okay, so we're gonna test this and we're gonna use you know, over 13,000 uh, data points that we had in, in the previous studies with some source task, okay? So I'm gonna use all that data to train my source neural network. And then I'm going to have a target. So this is now the new space where I want to make predictions. I'm going to take 1,000 random draws from here and only use 100 data points to now train with this transfer learning. So here I'm going to take the one, right? I'm going to take my source. I'm going to leave everything fixed and only allow the last layer to change. And I'm going to compare that to just using this 100 data points for the direct learning. I'm going to compare then these R squared values of, of the final training. Okay, again, with the idea is, can I bring down sort of the data requirements, right? So here I have, you know, 10 to the five data, bringing it down to 10 to the two, saving orders of magnitude in terms of the data requirements. Okay, so first we're gonna start with something that, you know, we, we felt comfortable with. So this is gonna be my source task. This is hydrogen absorption, 100 bar, 243K. I'm going to use this as my source to now make predictions of my target, which is going to be hydrogen, 100 bar, 130 Kelvin. All right, so all I'm doing is changing the temperature. Here I have the R square values for the direct learning. So we could see, you know, most, right, this is as a function of the thousand different random draws that we did. And we see, you know, even if it's, you know, 100 data points, the direct learning does very well. But the, the transfer learning, though, does better. Okay, across these. So these are different measures of, of that same thing. So this is the R square for the transfer learning versus that of the direct learning. And we see here, right, these are all essentially accumulated here where the transfer learning does very well compared to, to the direct learning. Same here now, this is the difference between them where absolutely most of them are above zero, right? So if, if they're at zero, that means they performed, excuse me, about the same. And then here then is the, um, so the right, the vast majority of points are in this area here, outperforming the, the direct learning. All right, so that was awesome. That gave us confidence. And now we started thinking about sort of that example of, oh, hydrogen and methane, the absorption looks very similar. And we do something there. So again, this is my source task now, Hornet bar, hydrogen, 
243K. Now I want to do predictions in methane, right? So methane, 100 bar, 298K. So can I use now a different molecule <clears throat> to make predictions about methane? So the direct learning, right? So now here we, we start seeing, it's like, okay, not all of them did very well. Here, transfer learning in most cases did very, very well. Okay, again, when we look at the R squared of the transfer learning versus that of the direct learning, most of the points then are in this area here, essentially associating uh, very good transfer learning and also indicating that direct learning did very well. When we look at the difference, there's you know where we really see how transfer learning is outperforming uh, the direct learning. So again, so this now shows us I can take areas that are information rich, okay, like hydrogen source task in this case to maybe make predictions in other areas where I may not be as data rich, right? So by orders of magnitude, and I can still make very accurate predictions, even though I'm using orders of magnitude less data. Okay, and then we thought, okay, let's let's get greedy here a little bit. Let's try to make now predictions based off of storage to separations. So can I take hydrogen 100 bar to 43 Kelvin again as my source? And now make predictions on the target, which now I'm going to try to predict xenon krypton adsorption at 5 bar and 298k. And here we see that this is awful, right? Both transfer learning, direct learning, doesn't matter. It, this was not very good. Okay, and so then that begs the question, okay, but then why? Like what, what's, it kind of makes sense, but, but why? And so you can start getting at those uh, answers if you start looking at the features. Okay, so we can uh, quantify the importance of the features for the various predictions. So for hydrogen, right, so this is my source task, <clears throat> 100 bar to 43K. This is a feature importance, right? So volumetric and gravimetric surface area are clearly the most important. And then when I look at 100 bar 130K, there's a similar distribution of the feature importance, similarly to methane. Right, so that explains why I was able to do this source task into these targets. Okay. Especially then when we compare to xenon and krypton and we look at the, the feature importance here and this is essentially evenly distributed, right? So even for, even for direct learning, we don't have the right features. Okay, so not only is the, the feature uh, importance distribution very different, we, we, we don't even have the right features to do normal learning on this. So then that signifies, you know, what are the limits then of using these, these types of transfer learning techniques in these contexts where it's really about the features. So if you have a space that you're data rich, another one that you're data poor, and you have a good sense of what the features are that matter, and you feel like they are similar in both cases, then transfer learning can be a great way for, for you to now make accurate predictions in, in that uh, data scarce space. Okay, and then if, if they don't, then you can't use transfer learning, okay? And so that sort of um, tells us about how we can leverage the data that's already out there. Now we start thinking about how can we generate data efficiently, especially in the case of adsorption isotherms. Okay, so what we're going to do is something called active learning. Okay, so, and what well, we think about sort of the, the normal type of, of learning or sort of what's called passive learning, you have some training data that you fit your model to with some labels, right? Because then it's supervised learning and then you have some approximated function that then allows you then to, to make the predictions if you did your training correctly. In this active learning context, <clears throat> we're going to evaluate at this point here, um, our performance, and then we're going to request data. So the model is going to be requesting data at different points until it reaches some desired predicted accuracy. And we're gonna, the way we're gonna do this is using a Gaussian process. <clears throat> so the idea behind this is gonna be a collection of functions. It's got a mean vector and a kernel matrix that's going to describe the relationship between the data. What is really neat about this type of, um, a framework is that when you make the predictions, you get the predicted, in this case, amount absorbed, but you also get uncertainties 
Okay, so because we have predicted uncertainties, now I can use that information to make this data request back to, to the simulations, right? So you can then think about how you can develop a model that is able to request data on the fly. So in this case, we're gonna be doing molecular simulations, but there's nothing that um, prohibits us from also using experiments in this context. Okay, so <clears throat> we're going to be doing pressure and temperature as our features, and then the amount absorbed at those conditions as our labels. We're gonna pre-process our data. We're gonna do our, our training of the, the Gaussian process. And then that's gonna give us the predictions and it's also gonna give us uncertainties. We're gonna go then to a, the point of, of maximum relative error. We're gonna check it against some threshold. If we're below, then we're done, great. But if not, then we're gonna tell then uh, a simple script. So, okay, submit a simulation at that point where we had the maximum relative uncertainty update our data, refit, and we continue on this process. Okay, and so then we start thinking about, okay, well, if I do this, if I now intelligently select which simulations to do, am, am I saving effort? Okay, and so we're gonna do this <clears throat> using methane and carbon dioxide. So we're gonna, that's, uh, we're gonna be modeling pure component absorption in copper BTC. We're gonna be using RASPA, still using UFF, uh, for copper BTC, we're going to be using trap for methane and CO2 <clears throat> and holding, uh, again, the, the atoms in, in their, their crystallographic positions. We're going to be looking at this range of pressure, so 10 to the minus 6 to 300 bar for methane <clears throat> and to 100 bar for CO2. And in the temperature space, uh, 100 to 300 Kelvin. Okay, so let me show you how this works on a pure component isotherm. So this is methane, for instance. Here we have the amount absorbed versus pressure. I've only fed to the GP these points in black, okay? So this red line now is that GP prediction. It's like, okay, give me the prediction. It also gave me the uncertainties, the predicted uncertainties. Okay, I'm gonna go then to the maximum relative uncertainty. It's this point in blue. This is my next iteration. Okay, I'm going to simulate there, give it that information. This is how the isotherm changes. Now this looks much closer to what we would expect from, from these types of isotherms. This is my next point with the maximum relative error. I simulate there, and this is the end. Okay, here the blue is the actual GCMC data, and the red is the GP prediction. It's a very close analysis with only using five points along those isotherms sort of intelligently selected <clears throat> using the GP predictions to guide those simulations. We also look at the predictions in the low pressure regime, right? So we know, especially if you want to do things like IAST and things like that, we know the low pressure regime is very important. And we see we have very good agreement in these areas as well. Okay, so that was just for the pure component. Now we wanna do this navigating temperature and pressure simultaneously. So we're gonna have this X test um, where we're gonna be sort of making these predictions in, in these spaces for the pressures for methane, for CO2. And we're also gonna be testing things in the low pressure regime. Uh, again, we're gonna have a um, mean relative error. So this is gonna be the real error. And we're gonna be using the GCMC results. <clears throat> to judge that. And then we have the GP predicted error, right? So these are strictly according to the uncertainties that are predicted by the Gaussian process and using that predicted to get a relative error. Okay. And then now we're going to be doing both temperature and pressure. And these are going to be the temperature points. I'm also going to be trying different priors. So when we first start these types of, of uh, processes, you know, what kind of data I give it to start could have an effect. So we're going to try you know, what we call boundary forms. So we're going to give it rich and low pressure and then some points in higher pressures. And then we're going to try just, you know, taking the log and then doing an even um, distribution there or just doing linear um, distributions. Okay. All right. So here are some results. This is my mean relative error versus... Um, so right, so where we're doing excess and, and the molecule and then whether we're doing the low pressure. So <clears throat> when we look at the full pressure range, 
we see that all the, the models actually perform very well for both methane and CO2. The differences really start popping up when we look at the low pressure regimes. But now boundary informed the log space um, really did um, better than the linearly spaced. And then we also look at the total number of iterations. So how much data that we need, right? That, that's also kind of the point. We want to we want to be efficient <clears throat> when, when we're generating these surrogate models. So the log space, especially for CO two, required a significant um, more number of points than boundary boundary informed, which remained pretty much the same. And then the linear one sort of um, was consistent between method and CO two. Right, just to show you then some results, here is methane uptake versus pressure, CO2 uptake versus pressure at different temperatures, and these are so from the boundary informed. Again, it's important to, to stress here, this isn't just sort of doing active learning along each temperature. We are simultaneously exploring temperature and pressure. So the active learning can first go here and then go here and then go there. Right. And so it's then interpolating through all those points um, simultaneously. So whereas normally, right, if you were to write down and run all these simulations, you know, you would take 10, 15 points across each one of the isotherms, given some temperature that, that you want to explore. Here, I'm doing all this simultaneously. And from uh, a scripting perspective, just you know, you can write a quick script that that does this for you, and it just takes the information. It's like, okay, where where's the next temperature and pressure I need to simulate, and submit then those, those simulations as opposed to submitting every isotherm by itself. Okay, <clears throat> we look at the low pressure regimes, so methane, CO two versus pressure. <clears throat> this is the boundary informed, and we see yeah we miss out on some of these features of uh, the absorption, so this is the GCMC results, and red here is the GP prediction. But overall, it does very well, okay? And then similarly for, for CO2. When we look at the others, though, we start seeing some very, very important differences, right? So here's the linearly spaced, where now we introduce some very different features, completely missing out on these areas. Uh, also introducing some... Uh, some curvatures here where, where there shouldn't be. Same thing with the log space, introducing some effects that, that we understand are non-physical for these systems. Okay, so from this perspective, the boundary informed prior uh, gives us the right balance of that accuracy, but also at least some of these checks um, seem to be more, more consistent with, with our expectations of, of, of the absorption behavior. Okay, and then lastly, we want to look at the convergence of these, right? So we <clears throat> we want to look at, okay, how is it predicting the error? Is that consistent with the actual error, right? So this is the GP. This is how its confidence is growing as a function of iteration for methane. And we can compare that directly to the actual GCMC simulations and also see that the actual error is also going down. Okay, so good. That gives us then confidence that the correspondence between the predicted error and the actual error is good. So we can use that predicted error as a good stopping point, as a good policy to tell us when we need, when we can stop simulating. We see similar results in terms for, for CO2, right? Where CO2, the predicted error goes down and then the actual error is also going down. Now, interestingly, <clears throat> we see here, we have number of iterations. This is around 30 for both CO2 and methane. We gave it 50 points as a, as a prior, so approximately <clears throat> 80 points here let's put that into context if i were to sort of sit down and submit all the simulations with you know a, a good number of of points along an isotherm say 15 20 and five degrees in between temperatures from 100 to 300 kelvin it gives me about you know 800 points more or less okay i can get accurate results essentially with predictions along with the same uh, error that is predicted from, from the GCMC with just 80. So I'm saving an order of magnitude of data requirements as I'm developing these circuit models for these absorption predictions, right? While simultaneously navigating temperature and pressure. And so now what we're looking forward to do then is looking at things like 
oh, can we now explore composition space as well? And looking at things like mixtures and, right? Because then those spaces really now your the simulations or experiments that you would need to do really explodes. And if you have temperature, pressure, and composition, how can we use these active learning techniques to now help us explore in those spaces? Okay, so with that, I'd like to summarize, right? So this is now thanks to all the efforts in the community, we have a lot of data out there. Machine learning is playing an increasing role in the uh, materials discovery and design for metal organic frameworks and, and other materials in general, okay? And so you have different parts of this workflow. Okay, we have focus today on doing the structural databases um, and then submitting them to experiments to generate these high fidelity data sets. And how do we go about this? Okay, we showed you examples of <clears throat> how these efforts can lead to uh, materials discovery in the context of hiding and storage and how using that data, we can now potentially explore new spaces with transfer learning. Again, lowering then the data requirements for the development of new machine learning models. And in the cases maybe that we can, perhaps using something like active learning, this sequential design of adsorption simulations or experiments can be particularly beneficial. So with that, um, I'd like to thank you for your attention and I'm happy to, to answer any questions. And for those of you who are watching uh, on YouTube uh, post fact, please feel free to reach out to me uh, to my email or follow me on Twitter. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. So thank you very much again to, to the organizers for, for the kind invitation. Thank you very much, uh, Jamil. Very interesting presentation. And thank you um, for your time again today. Thank you. Um, we have, there were a few questions from, from Nick Wilkins about the, the earlier material on machine learning, which you then addressed um in the following <laughs> slides um but but he had another one here uh which is potentially interesting and you know you spoke about the ANNs for these applications mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and his question is around does the type of model that performs well depend on the application that you're looking at or is it or is it safe to say that ANNs are overall a generally well applied, like a, a good choice? Oh, I see, I see. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think it's going to depend on a couple of things. One is how much data do you have? Um, I think that's going to be an important thing to, to think about when you're deciding which machine learning algorithm to use. If you don't feel comfortable with the number of data, perhaps uh, a GP type thing could, could work for you. The other part that's really important in this, but this would go through um, essentially all machine learning models, and that is your features, right? If you don't have the right features to describe, right? If you don't have the right descriptors, right? That are going to make, you know, whatever process you want sort of machine learning readable, if you will, then it doesn't matter what model you're gonna try, you know, it's not going to work, right? So the the all the dash of garbage in, garbage out still holds for for machine learning. Whereas if you know if you're not putting in the right features to describe the process, then you're going to miss out on on important predictions. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, valid, useful, useful information and points there for thank you people to consider. Um. You then, after this, kind of showed the um, transfer learning, which mm -hmm. I thought was was pretty interesting. And I had some questions about that. And Arvind Rajendran also has some questions on that um, from YouTube. Um, the examples that you showed were kind of, you know, supercritical hydrogen methane adsorption. And both of those cases are mostly governed by polarizability in terms of adsorption mechanism. And how do you think this would compare if you were to then try and do transfer learning on something like atmospheric water harvesting, mm -hmm. which could be a completely, you know, a disaster in comparison. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that links into Arvind's question, which is, in what cases do these techniques work well and when do they fail? 
um, is there any relationship related to the mechanism or is this just a amount of data problem? Like, can you get over this with more data? So uh, again, th this goes back to features. Uh, you could have, right? So it, it, it's kind of a, a connected answer. Uh, data can solve a lot of woes. Um, in this context, right? So here we were able to show um, how, right? These features in particular, so strictly textual, right? So these are things that you can characterize potentially from, you know, in, in our case, we just use uh, like things like CO++ or, or RASPA to get at these types of informations for the structures, but strictly textual, right? There's no chemistry information. There's no charge information, uh, nothing. Of, of that sort. And yet we are able to make accurate predictions and show successful transfer learning from hydrogen to methane. We did, you know, we showed it completely fails for xenon krypton. And it, you know, it's not just for the combined, but even if you try to do the single one, it doesn't work very well um, in, in when, when they're together, right? And the reason is we don't have the right features, right? So you could potentially start adding in features that maybe not important um, for the absorption process you're currently trying to describe, but maybe important for a future one. And that could help ameliorate because you're still capturing that important feature that describes the absorption process. If you're missing that feature, data will not save you. Because I, I mean, at least that, that, that's the lesson we got. We, we have a lot of data. We have over 13,000, which in this context is, is a lot of data. Um, but we have over 13,000 points describing the xenon krypton uh, absorption. And even for direct learning, even using all of that data, we were not able to get good machine learning models. And the reason being, we were missing the feature, right? So coming back to your, you know, atmospheric water harvesting example, you know, if, if, if the features that you have, right, these textual features are not able to describe the direct learning, process of that it doesn't matter where you know the transfer learning won't won't be able to do so either thank you very much for very comprehensive uh question <laughs> i hope that uh answer and i hope that answered um arvin's question uh, it certainly did for me right, thank you um do you have any before we get on to the to the next question do you have any thoughts of what is missing for the xenon krypton scenario uh yes so uh, so there's been work out there you know by uh my good friend Corey simon um from oregon state and so he published a, a paper i believe when, when yeah when he was working with with baron um on precisely doing this type of predictions and so they have uh, an energetic a uh, component to this so they have uh, an energy a feature essentially that describes the energy that the xenon and the krypton are feeling when they're inside of the structure. And so once they include that feature, they're able to make accurate predictions. So in these cases, having that energetic uh, component, um, a, a, yeah, that's what allows you to make uh, accurate predictions. From our case, we were thinking more of like, okay, these are things that you could potentially get um, experimentally um, for all the structures, that energetic features a, at least it's not clear to me right now how you would go about obtaining something like that. So that's why we didn't include it um, for, for this type of study. And we just limited it to, to these types of textual properties. Right, thank you. Thanks mm -hmm. for that. Um, and I think we have, uh, Nick Wilkins also had a couple of clarification questions, if that's okay. Yeah, um, absolutely. For the, for the CO2 methane work you were, showing you know towards the end mm -hmm. um were they single component isotherms or was there some kind of competitive adsorption also accounted for in, in these cases right so for when we did the sequential absorption design for right now excuse me these are pure component so it's pure component methane pure component co2 okay we are working on uh the composition so now we're working on uh, also exploring that compositional space between CO2 methane and then other other important gas mixtures as well to now, yeah, see, see what this looks like. And some of the things that we're finding are that, you know, especially composition can introduce some, some very sharp features into to the absorption landscape. Um, and 
yeah, that that can introduce some some interesting challenges, but we're we're overcoming it. So be on the lookout for for that publication. Um, hopefully, um, this uh, this semester. Um, well, we will. We'll keep our eyes peeled. Thank you. Uh, thanks again uh, for your time today. Um, I'm going to pass back over to to Nick, who's going to uh, wrap up the session for today and uh, give the information on the upcoming webinars as well. Great. So I'll stop sharing. Thank you, Dr. Colon, for your presentation, Navigating Adsorption Landscapes and Metal Organic Frameworks. We also thank all of our attendees for joining this webinar and hope that it was both educational and enjoyable. An edited version of this webinar will be posted on the IES YouTube channel with an announcement on the IES Twitter feed. The hope is that the work discussed today will be a useful resource for the adsorption science community in the future. The next confirmed IES webinar will be a panel session on the use of the BET area with David Ferrain Genes, Diana Azevedo, Kanchi Anya, and Darren Broom. This will be on September 29th at 1 p.m. UTC. This will actually be the first of this kind to for us, and um, we're quite excited for it. Announcements regarding the next webinar and other IES online events will be posted on our Twitter feed and through the IES mailing list. With that, we thank you for joining us. We hope that you will join us again soon.